I'm excited. We're starting a, a new series, looking through the upper room discourse, the teachings of Jesus in the upper room to his disciples. Uh, you probably are familiar with the upper room, mostly from the painting, maybe, um, where they go in and say table for 26, <laughs> but we're all going to sit on one side of the table. <laughs> Some of you will get that on the way home. Uh, <laughs> But the, the, the Gospel of John, just to start with, is, is, a, is a wonderful book. And I encourage you to, to read through the Gospel of John and its unique telling of the story of Jesus. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the other Gospels, are called the Synoptic Gospels. They have much that overlaps, and they tell many of the same stories. But John presents Jesus in a different light to us. And much of what John is trying to teach us, John is, is conveying the purpose of John writing is to, to prove and to exclaim the deity of Jesus Christ, that, that Jesus Christ is God incarnate, God made into flesh, the word, the logos, the wisdom of God, the, the creative force of God that made the world and spoke it into existence, that that same God put on flesh and walked the earth as Jesus Christ. And we can trust in him. We can turn our attention to him. We can put our hope in Jesus Christ, who is God. John is organized in this way. It starts with the great John chapter 1, this Christology passage, the rich teachings about Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then chapters 1 through 12 of John are what's called the book of signs or uh, the book of wonders. And Jesus performs seven miracles in those 12 chapters. And he also makes at least seven, depending on how you count, statements, these great I am statements where he says, I am the bread of life or I am the resurrection and the life. And then we get to chapter 13, and the, the narrative changes, and we get this extended passage of John 13 through 17 of Jesus on the night before he was betrayed, and we see in a, in a bigger chunk than really anywhere else the teachings of Jesus, the heart of Jesus, what he wants to convey to his disciples. This is, this is the culmination of their apprenticeship, of their discipleship experience. This is what you got to make sure you know before we come to the end. And then in chapter 18, we transition into the, what's called the passion narrative, where we see describe the work of Jesus Christ in his betrayal and arrest, his unjust trials, his abuse, his abandonment by his disciples, ultimately his crucifixion, and then resurrection. So looking at this chapter here, we're, we're, we're going to see that, that, like I said, the heart of Jesus is displayed particularly in chapters 14 through 17, which we're going to work our way through, that we see what Jesus wants to say and it, it, it sounds like this, stick with me, believe in me, follow me, abide in me, live in me, and even you are going to fail. You are going to fall short and abandon me, but come back to me, trust in me, run back to my feet. Hard times are coming too. Hard times are coming, not just this weekend, but in the future. Hard times are coming, harder than you know. Trust me. I'm sending a helper. Your sorrow will turn to joy. And there's more going on than you can see. And take heart, for I have overcome the world. Be transformed, be made holy, be unified, and be kept. Be kept. John 
chapter 13 sets the stage for this teaching of Jesus. We're not going to walk through John 13, but quickly I want to summarize to you as we set the stage for Jesus' teaching, Jesus' discourse, where he pours out his heart. First, he does a couple of things in John chapter 13. One in a familiar story, he washes the feet of his disciples. I don't have time to get into it, but there's, I found one commentator make a great parallel of John chapter 13 and the story of Jesus' washing of the feet. In Philippians chapter 2, in, the, in a great passage about Christ where it talks about him emptying himself and taking the form of a servant, taking the place of a servant. And we can see that, that Jesus acts out almost in a symbolic way. He gets up from dinner and he takes off his cloak. He takes off that which he has been robed with. And he wraps himself in a towel like a servant would. And he takes the place of a humble servant going all the way down to the feet of his disciples. He washes their feet. And then he makes the statement, the shocking statement for these group of men who have walked together so closely for the past three years. He says, One of you will betray me. One of you will betray me. He also says, in fact, all of you will desert me. And where I am going, this this next part that I'm about to experience, referring to, again, the passion work of the cross, you cannot follow me into. I'm going to go and I'm going to suffer and I'm going to die and you can't, Come with me for this part. And and then, like we talked about, we see what follows, the betrayal and trials, abuse and abandonment. And so in in that context, we come to John chapter 14. I'm going to read for us this morning, John chapter 14, verses 1 through 4, and I invite you, if you are willing and able, to stand with me for the reading of God's word. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you that. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. You may be seated. This opening statement that Jesus made has been oft repeated. Something that that people look to as comfort, look to when when things get hard. It's recited at at funerals. It's it's told as advice or counsel to people who are experiencing suffering. Let not your hearts be troubled. Let not your hearts be troubled. Don't worry. Don't worry. But in the context, and particularly of what Jesus has just said, and as I told you about John chapter 13, Jesus has said some troubling things. Jesus has said some things that are hard, that are hard to hear. And in fact, later on, as we work our way through this passage, as we work our way through the teachings up the upper room, he's going to say some troubling things. Things like you will suffer, things like the world will hate you. If the world hated me, it's going to hate you all the more. And in fact, to his disciples, to those in the room, he, he would even say, all of you will suffer. All of you will suffer. The only one in the room who wasn't martyred, besides Judas, of course, who went off and killed himself. The, the only one who wasn't martyred of the disciples would be John, who lived his life in exile on an island by himself, imprisoned for much of his life. All of these men will 
suffer. And the, the New Testament church, the particularly early history of the church, is ripe with suffering and oppression. But in this context, Jesus says, let not your hearts be troubled. Even when all the world falls apart, even when everything goes wrong, even when the world hates you, let not your hearts be troubled. Now, we've we got to be careful to understand what Jesus is not saying is, get over it. It's no big deal. You know, like that little league dad who's, who's behind the fence yelling, get up, rub some dirt on it, you'll be fine. Jesus is not here minimizing our suffering. Jesus is not here saying, nothing bad is coming, don't worry about it. Jesus is saying, in the midst of all that will happen, in the midst of the hardness of this life, in the midst of abandonment and isolation, let not your hearts be troubled. A beautiful truth to this statement, this passage of Jesus. If you quickly turn back a page, you will see in John chapter 13, verse 21, Jesus, after he washed the feet and when he gets into this teaching that one of you will betray me, that, that bad things are about to happen, we see in verse 21 of chapter 13, Jesus was troubled in his spirit. I think we can take a direct parallel and, and, and message from that, that Jesus was troubled on our behalf so that he could say to us, let not your hearts be troubled. That Jesus took on the troubles of this world, that Jesus bears the weight of the hatred of this world on our behalf so that he can say to us, let not your hearts be troubled. More than don't worry about it, it's not a big deal. It's more don't worry about it, I got it. I got it. I carry the load. I'll take the trouble for you. Jesus was troubled on our behalf and can say this to us. And what a, what a countercultural, radical thing this is and would be in our world today. Man, if you could use one word to describe the way our world is going, I think anxious would be right up there with any description that you would give. This world is anxious. People are scared. People are worried. People's hearts are troubled. Because as we've talked about, this life is hard. There's so much uncertainty. There, there, there's so much going on that, that, that we are troubled. But if we can hear these words of Jesus to us, if we could really rest in Jesus and let our hearts not be troubled, what a radical example and testimony that would be to an anxious world. Let not your hearts be troubled. If we could be a non-anxious presence in this anxious world, how, how enticing, how, how people would look to that and want what we have. Calm confidence, one, one writer said, calm confidence is our sacred calling. Even, even in the face of death. Because we can know that because of Jesus Christ, there is a path through death to the other side. That there is life everlasting waiting for us. Man, let not your hearts be troubled. If we could take that and put it into practice, how great that would be. And, and why? Why does Jesus say this? What, what, is, what is the foundation? What is the, what, why, how can we do that? How can we not be troubled? Believe. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Have faith. Believe God. Put your trust in God. If, if there was one imperative that you took from the New Testament, if there's one command that, that, that is given to us, again, I would say it's believe. Believe in Jesus. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. 
That's the message of the gospel. That's core to what the gospel is, that we are saved by faith alone. That our only response to the gospel is repentance and faith, acknowledging our need and saying, God, yes, I trust you. Believe in God. Believe the gospel. Believe the good news that you can be forgiven of your sins, that you can be rescued from the path you put yourself on, from the judgment you pulled down on yourself. Just believe in Jesus. Believe is the answer to all our problems. And I don't want to say that in a trite way that minimizes, again, suffering and what people do go through. And I, I'm all for medicine. I'm all for counseling. But there is something true that deep down in our hearts, believe the gospel is the answer to everything that this world is going through. Believe. Believe in God. Believe also in me. The, the purpose statement for the book of John, John even writes it, it for us in chapter 20, when he says, the reason I, I wrote this book, this gospel, after all, to, to tell you the story of Jesus, he says in chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Believe. Believe in God and believe also in me. And Jesus now here is saying not a, not a, not a parallel, not believe in God, and then tack me onto that as well. It's not believe in two things, but believe in God and, and focus that belief, focus that trust, focus your hope on me, who is the second person of the Trinity, who is God himself. It's not believe in God and then add on me, but believe in God and believe in Jesus Christ, who is God, who is, has always been God himself, God in the flesh. And, and here he, so many times you hear skeptics talk about how Jesus in the Bible is, is, is different than what we make him out to be and that Jesus never claimed to be God in the flesh. Right here is a very strong statement where Jesus is saying, I am divine. I am God. Believe, put your trust in me. He is equated with the Father. And in a way, as Jesus is revealing, again, his heart to his disciples here in the upper room and, and unfolding the things which he has been revealing slowly and, and relatively and, and, and piece by piece, now he no longer veiled makes statements of the truth. I am God. Trust me. Believe in me. And belief, I've already used trust as a synonym or a replacement word for believe. And, and this, uh, the belief of the gospel, the belief of the New Testament is stronger than just, I know what you're talking about. Sure, I believe that Jesus was there. I believe with my mind, but it's a life-transforming faith. It's putting your whole trust and hope into that person. It's handing over of control. I was thinking about this, and I thought of the, you know, if you're a fan of classic cinema, the the old Disney animated film Aladdin. Uh, I was thinking about that a lot this week, where Aladdin says to Jasmine, "Do you trust me?" And it's all like batted eyelashes, and and, and then when he's in disguise later, he says it again, he puts his hand out to pull her up on the magic carpet. Do you trust me? And she goes, "Oh." I think there's that, there's that offer here from Jesus of trust. Do you trust me? And more is just like, yeah, I guess we'll see. I'll jump on the magic carpet and see if I don't fall off. I'm a little bit scared, but I, I'll give it a try. Now Jesus is saying, do you trust me? Put all your hope in me. Do you 
trust me? Will you give me your life? Will you give me everything? Will you turn it over to me and trust that I will take care of you, that I will bear the trouble for you, that I will take away the punishment of your sins, that I will give you the power to overcome sin? Do you trust me? Put your trust in me. Believe. Believe in God. Believe also in Jesus. Because he says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'm going to, to, to my father's house where there's many rooms, where there's lots of place for you. And I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'm going to make a home for you. Man, home, home is such a big word for us as human beings. And sometimes we take it for granted. I had the experience of living overseas as a, as a young child. And there's this idea for people who live outside of what's called their passport country. Uh, and there's this new kind of term that was come up by psychologists several decades ago called third culture kids where a third culture kid may be an American citizen living in Austria, as was my experience, and I'm not living in the American culture. I'm not in my first culture, and, but I'm not fully, totally immersed and a part of the Austrian culture. I'm not in that second culture, and so I'm caught kind of somewhere in between. I'm caught in this third culture that's hard to describe and define. And, and it brings up all these kinds of questions. Who am I, really? As an adult, I got an opportunity to work with third culture kids. And we went back, our family, as missionaries to Germany, and our mission field was these third culture kids. We lived in Dusseldorf, Germany, and worked with kids from all over the world, some from America and Britain and, and, and Iran and Saudi Arabia and Korea and Guatemala. And we had these kids from all over the world, and they were asking these questions. Who am I? Where do I fit Asking a third culture kid, where are you from, can be a terrifying question. I, well, what do you mean, where am I from? Where was I born? Where are my parents from? Where, where did my grandparents grow up? Where do I live now? Where have I lived most of the time during my formative years? The other part about third culture kids is they only stay in one place for an average of, of two and a half to three years. So they lived a lot of places. Where is home? I don't know that I can answer that. Where are you from? Where do I belong? But that, that is a core question for us as human beings. Who am I? Where do I belong? Who are, who are my people? Where is home for me? And what Jesus here is saying is that home is where he is. That where you belong where you are accepted, where you are a, a, a nation, you are made into a people, where home is for you, where your soul can rest is with Jesus. And he's preparing a place for you. He is building that home as we speak. And just as an interesting note, this passage here in the old King James Version it says, in my father's house, there are many mansions. And we get the idea of, of mansions for us waiting in glory from this passage. Um, and that's an interesting. It's, a, it's actually within the semantic range of definition of the word. It's, it's not a terrible translation. But in context, it doesn't seem to be what Jesus is saying. And I think the bigger problem is we got a, we got a bad picture from that idea. We got the picture that Jesus is somewhere on a cloud with a construction permit dealing with code enforcement and preparing a mansion for us. And we got focused on, on two of the wrong things. One, I'm building. One, the idea of the building process. Some of you have experienced, some of you work in the construction trades. Our family has been remodeling our home and, and are just so 
done with some of the both construction trades and the, the county. We've had some fun conversations with the county recently. And we get this picture that Jesus is, is out there saying, oh, well, the supply chain, I wish I had. I don't have enough windows for, for Joe's mansion here, so we're going to keep working on it. And we also got fixated on the mansion part. We get, we get fixated on the, the, the wealth of heaven. We think about streets of gold and pearly gates, and, 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 and we think of the riches. We think, ooh, how great is it going to be, the riches there. But what Jesus here is saying is not about the riches of heaven. It's about the home. It's about the belonging. It's about the place for you a place to call your own, a place where you can be with him forever. The glory of heaven is not streets of gold. The glory of heaven is not crowns and diadems and jewels. The glory of heaven is Christ. The reward of heaven is Christ and his perfect and everlasting presence. That is the treasure. That is the reward. And he is going to make a place for you a place you belong. And, and, and it's not, he's not caught up in the building process. He spoke the world into existence in, in six days. He said, let there be light. He said, let the, let the earth exist and the waters separate. He spoke and billions of uncountable galaxies sprang into existence. He's not caught up in the process, and it's taken him a long time to build your mansion. He's gone to do his work on the cross. From here, from this statement, he's going to purchase your pardon, purchase your belonging through his work on the cross, and he's going to build his church, build his glory, build his inheritance. The people who are called by his name. He's going to Prepare a place for us, a place where we belong. That even if we have no place here on earth, even if everything falls apart here in this world, that we belong somewhere else. That our resting place, that our home where we can be ourselves and kick our shoes off, where we are accepted fully, is with Jesus Reminded of the words of the old hymn, This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. There are better things to come. There is belonging and deeper acceptance. There are treasures forevermore to come. And that's where Jesus is going to do that work. He here talks to his disciples and says, I'm going to go away. He's already said before that I'm going to go to a place where you can't follow. I'm going to walk into this suffering where you're not going to come with me. But then I will come back. I will return. And then you can be with me. Then you can be with me and you, you know the way to be with me. He's going to purchase our salvation and prepare a place and receive the people unto himself. So he's going to go and then he's going to return. Fascinating here in the, the grammar. Again, some of you get excited about grammar and some of you do not. But I think this is really good. When he says, I will come again. If I go away, I will come again. It's kind of that present perfect it's not someday in the future I will come again. And the commentators who I read all agree that this is not only an allusion to the second coming of Christ. He's not only talking about someday, which has yet to come even now in 2023. He's not talking only about his second coming in glory when he comes on a white horse with a tattoo on his thigh and a sword coming out of his mouth. He's talking about his coming towards us, his presence being made available to us. And from the, from, from the work of his, from the time of his completed work through the cross and resurrection, he is 
coming into the world, continually making his presence available to us. Again, one commentator, Westcott, said it this way, Christ is, in fact, from the moment of his resurrection, ever coming into the world and to the church and to men as the risen Lord. I am coming back to give my presence to you. I will be there with you. I am coming. I'm making my presence known and available to you. And later on, he's going to talk about the helper, and he's going to send the Holy Spirit to be the presence of God for us to live inside of us. I am coming to you. I will keep coming to you. The the last song that we're going to sing today after communion, Jesus Strong and and kind. I I love it. I've I've not sung it before today, but as we were practicing it, even this morning, I was struck by how Jesus strong and kind bids me to come. In the first few verses we talk about, he says, I can come to him. But there's one verse towards the end where where it switches. See if I can find it. Where it, it switches and says, Jesus said, if I am lost, he will come to me. And he showed me on the cross, he will come to me. Before we were saying, Jesus said, if I fear, I should come to him. No one else can be my shield. I should come to him. But when I am lost, when I am hopeless and dead in my sins, he will come to me. He is the initiative taking, pursuing God of love. He comes to us, even when we weren't looking for him, even when we were dead in our trespasses. He comes to us. Praise God. He comes to us. And he says, I will bring you with me. And if I come again, I will take you to myself. I will bring you along with me. That's the the word he uses there. It is to, to bring alongside, to bring someone with you, to go together, that I will bring you with me. When I come to you, make my presence available to you, then I will not just leave you there, but walk beside you through your life, bring you with me in the path that I am going. Where I am, you may be also. Again, that that's the reward to be with Jesus. And he ends with, you know the way. You, You know the way He's saying that you have all the information that you need. Everything that that you need to be rescued, to be saved, to to walk through this life towards him and not towards sin. You know the way. Everything you have, everything you need, you have. So I I hope that we, as we turn again to this passage, I'm, I'm excited about this series, and I hope that we hear the heart of Jesus, that we hear his love, his his moving towards us, his invitation to us, that we would trust in him, that we would believe, that that is our action word to be taken from this passage, believe, put your trust in Jesus, give him control of every aspect of your life, believe that he is better than your sin. Believe that in his presence there is fullness of joy and at his right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Really believe that and see what it does to the call of sin on your life. If I truly believe that Jesus' pleasures are better, then that sin will no longer call out to me in the same way. I know that it's dead and empty. I know that no hope is found there, that no belonging is found there. Believe that you belong with Christ. That is what you were created for. And don't be anxious. Run to Jesus. Let's pray. Almighty God, thank you for your work on our behalf. Thank you. Thank you that you were troubled so that we cannot be troubled. That you suffered so that we can live. That you died that we could have eternal life. And that you preparing a place for us. 
that you pursued us, that you come into the world, and that you make a place that we can belong. Help us to know that. Help us to carry that with us. Help us to trust that we belong to you, that you're better. Transform us in that way, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.